worshiping together when you may not even be able to meet together. Hello, and welcome to Ministry Now, a resource from the faculty at Southwestern Seminary helping you live your calling in an ever-changing ministry landscape. I'm Katie McCoy, and today we're discussing corporate worship and worship ministry during the COVID-19 pandemic with Dr. Joseph Kreider, Dean of the School of Church Music and Worship here at Southwestern Seminary. Dr. Kreider, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. McCoy. It is a joy to be with you. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Oh, we're so grateful to talk to you. You know, when we think about worship ministry, typically all of us have something that comes to mind. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of what it looks like during this coronavirus, would you help us understand where you're coming from when you're talking about the idea of worship in the context of the local church? Yeah, thanks, Katie. That's a great question. And it's probably a question that's maybe a lot more involved in, in, and probably a lot more important than a lot of people might think. Um, let me begin by, by saying that about 20 years ago, uh, the Christian pollster, and, and maybe that's not the best way to describe him, but, but George Barna uh, and, and Lifeway Research interviewed literally thousands of people and asked them to define worship. Now, now these people were, were interviewed, who were interviewed were evangelical Christians who really did understand and were able to articulate that faith in Jesus Christ was the only way to salvation. But an incredibly high percentage of born-again Christians were either not able to answer the question, what is worship? Or, amazingly, they gave bogus answers to the questions, <laughs> such as, well, it's just singing in church or going to church. So, so we realized that, that even in its definition, I think a lot of people in the evangelical community might have a difficult time being able to come up with a, with a, with a concise biblical definition of really what it is. I, I think the biblical definition for worship is revealed in the pattern of worship we see all throughout the Bible. And I guess the best way for me to explain that is that worship is like a rhythm. As a musician, that's not surprising that I might say that. Yeah. But worship is like a rhythm, a God-initiated rhythm. And he initiates the rhythm by revealing himself to his redeemed. And the redeemed receive that revelation by faith and then respond to him, acknowledging his infinite glory and his infinite perfection through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, so on a very basic level, if we think of worship as, as God revealing, because God is self-revealing, God revealing and his people responding, we, we realize that, that it is, it's that rhythm. That, I think, probably is the very basic and the very essential aspect of biblical worship, of God revealing his people responding. So if it's bigger than singing, where, where would you take us to in Scripture to help form that biblical definition of what worship is. Sure, that, that's great. And I think, you're, I think you're, your opening line there, Katie, is perfect if it's bigger, if, if it's bigger than singing. And indeed it is. I think all of the, the effective definitions of biblical worship don't have the word music or singing in them mm. as, because we wrongly associate it with worship in the first place. And, and we see that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is full of this rhythm of God revealing and his people responding. We, we can go back uh, to, to the very earliest parts of the scripture. You, you think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What were they doing? They were all responding to God revealing. They were, they were responding to God's revelation. And, and even, so those are the macro stories, right? Those are the, those are the big names. But you even begin to look at some of the micro stories, even within those. And you see, for example, one that just came to, I thought of was, was Abraham's servant when he went to find a, a wife for Isaac. And he prayed specifically that the Lord would answer his prayer. And specifically, God revealed to Abraham's servant, that we don't even know his name, that Rebekah was to be Isaac's wife. And, and what did he do? When, when all of that came to, to pass, we see very clearly that, that Abraham's servant bowed in worship. He bowed in what? He bowed in response. So when we see this rhythm, we see clearly that worship is not just an activity of life. 
It's the activity of life. And you're describing this as this is kind of the point and purpose of our lives. So in light of that, then, how do we translate that to the hour, hour and a half that happens in, on Sunday morning that we typically think of as, well, this is worship. This is what we do for 20 to 30 minutes before the, the sermon. And, and it's sort of isolated and compartmentalized from the rest of the worship service. How do we translate that sort of theology of worship to the actual singing part? Yeah, that, that's great. And, and I, think, I think the beauty of that is that we begin to see the, the edifying nature of the corporate gathering. We begin to see the very clear, the, the clarity of, of the writer of Hebrews telling us not to forsake the assembling of together and and the church that that we attend here in in Fort Worth we had our first service after 13 weeks together and it was such an incredible joy yes. just to be in fellowship with one another um I, I i can't even explain it as i heard people singing around me as i saw people responding to the word uh, as it was preached I, I, was, I was struck by the fact of how much we miss the vital nature of, of doing that corporately. You know, God knew before, the, before, the, before time began that, that his people, that the, that the way we're wired as human beings, that every seven days we would need that Sabbath. Every seven days we would need that that what I would call, Katie, a, a recalibration of our hearts mm -hmm. and our minds. Mm -hmm. Not that that can't happen individually every morning or every evening as we have our own times of, of private devotion and worship individually, but that there is the necessity of the body as the, as the Trinity. Again, I go back to it as the Trinity represents that and, and gives us a beautiful picture of the necessity of community. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit necessarily being joined in community. Mm. So too do we find that we need that as well. We sing, as we think about the aspect of singing, we sing not only because we're commanded to throughout the scriptures, right? In the Psalms and, and in several places that we'll talk about in just a minute, but even just that we were commanded to, that would be enough, right? But, but again, what is singing? If we go back to what we talked about just a moment ago, the idea of singing, it's a response. Expression. Yeah. Because it's an expression of our response to the infinite grace given to us through what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. And, and that singing is, a, is, again, it's a response that, um, that, that is more than just discursive language. It, it is... It is, it is on the wings of music that allow us to do that together at one moment, in one time, it, on, the, on the beautiful wings of melodies that allow us, that allow us to do that together in incredible ways. And, and I think one of the problems that we see, that, that I've seen in my years, 30 years of being a worship leader and, and, and doing it incorrectly, honestly, or doing it maybe not as biblically as I wish I would have early on, is that we make worship, instead of about relationship, we make it about experience, or we make it about production, mm -hmm. or we've made it about music. But, and, and as we, the moment that we equate music with worship, or worship music, or music with worship, I think we lose and we miss the essence of biblical worship because God gave us music so that we would have a beautiful and incredible way of joining our voices and hearts as one voice um, to do what to respond to God, to respond to relationship and to what he's done and what he's revealed through his word, through his son, by his spirit. So let's take all of this that you've set the table for us so beautifully and talk about how do we do this in a time when we can't gather 
Um, and at, by the time our viewers see this, we will be, well, we don't really know where we'll be in terms of coronavirus and lockdown. Some places have fully reopened, some are in that modified reopening. Some places um, are still struggling with when they will be able to fully reopen. And of course, we don't know what the future holds in terms of a second wave of the coronavirus. Um, and we may be looking at some additional quarantines in the future. So relating that to worship ministry, what are some ways to engage in corporate worship when there are no gatherings, when there's a lockdown? What does that look like in immediate families? And then if you would, what does that look like for single Christians? Um, the unmarried Christian who is separate from biblical community, separate from being able to gather corporately, how do we do worship in that context? Yeah, and, and I, think, I think what you've articulated are, are some of the most difficult things about what we've seen for the last 13 or so weeks. Mm -hmm. um, what, I think, what I think it's helped us to see perhaps is that it has maybe stripped away mm -hmm. some of the experiential crutches that yeah. we might have depended upon to to try to engage people or produce in people that really don't maybe have anything to do with with responding to god um so i i, th I think as we as we look at at, at the at, at doing this either in a small group or in a family of you know maybe the the, the family worship, or even for someone who is a single, I, I am grateful for what churches have done to at least provide the, the avenues of the streaming. Um, but I'm also, I'm, I'm also, what, what we decided here as a faculty at, at the School of Church Music and Worship is that we wanted to provide a, a series of, of eight family, small group, even individual um, worship orders that were saturated primarily with scripture um, and that that have embedded in them uh, hymns that are public domain. So we didn't have to worry about any kind of, uh, we didn't have to worry about any kind of copyright issues. But but what we did was we, we created worship orders. Some people might call those liturgies that would help just guide someone through a passage of scripture uh, that really is that rhythm that we talked about, God revealing and us responding. And uh, in that, hoping to help develop in either a small group or even in an individual, maybe a greater awareness of, of worship being that idea of revelation and response. And we posted those on, on our website, which is artistictheologian.com, www.artistictheologian.com. And the, it's just called Small Group Family Worship Resources. And it's basically during the lockdown. So we, we wanted to help people see, perhaps either in small groups or families or, or even individuals, that this might be a time where we begin to look at not relying so much on the performers on a platform, <laughs> right? Or that what's being worshiped at us, but more of our responsibility in the idea of response as well. So I, I hope that, I hope that somewhat answered that question, uh, Dr. McCoy. And, and uh, because I, 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 the, the, the questions are complex. I mean, how do we do that? What do we do? What, what are the most important things to do? And I think, honestly, we run to his word. We, we run and we take comfort in the thing, in the one thing that's transtemporal, the Bible. It, the one thing that's transcultural, the Bible. The one thing that's transgenerational, the Bible, right? The one thing that does not return void, the Bible. Uh, we run to his word through the power of the Holy Spirit, realizing that it's in Christ that we're responding to. 
Imagine that you right now were a minister of uh, worship and music in a local church. What are some of the things that you would be thinking of before returning to familiar things like choir, choir rehearsal? I'm sure you heard of the church um, out in Washington State. They prematurely resumed their choir rehearsals, and I think over 40 contracted the illness and two died. Um, and so the the very eminent risk that we have with our church members, and if, and you know the you can speak to the science of actual singing and how that how that can put people at greater risk if they're not appropriately socially distanced. So what are some things that worship pastors, music leaders need to be thinking of before resuming some of the the familiar activities in their church? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to qualify what I'm going to say by you. I am not a medical expert, <laughs> and and I am grateful that in our SBC life, our Southern Baptist Convention life, that our churches are autonomous, so they are free to move at the impulse of the Holy Spirit working in and among their leadership and their people. Um, so I think that's really, really important for us to realize that that these are decisions that I think, as you and I, Katie, have, have thumbprints that are very, very different from one another, so too do all of our churches. And so for, for me to make a pronouncement to say all churches should do this would be, would be extremely uh, unwise and, and, um, and unhealthy. Um, but what I would say is that uh, we, we attended church yesterday morning for the first time in 13 weeks, and, and our pastoral staff had really thought through a lot of the necessary logistics of making sure that the environment was safe, beginning with the encouragement to people who were concerned to make sure that they knew it was it was encouraged for them to stay at home or people that may be uh, immunocompromised that they stay at home and that there would be there that there would be a, a desire among the staff among the church to realize the importance of that for those people but the staff had thought through things like designating pews very, very clearly to make sure that social distancing was, was practiced. Um, they didn't pass an off plate. Mm -hmm. They encouraged people to wear masks. And then in between services, I saw an army of folks going through the, going through the church, disinfecting the pews, and, and there were no hymnals in the racks. So they were very, very intentional about thinking through the logistics that, that needed to be observed prior to the prior to the point of anybody even coming in. So I think that intentionally thinking through, following CDC guidelines for social distancing, listening to wise biblical counsel on the best way to facilitate these these gatherings are really, really important. And again, I if you don't mind, I wanna I want to point people who might be listening to our our artistic theologian website again. We had the privilege of having 10 or at least 10 state worship consultants from all over the country from the SBC to speak on our webinar and on our webinar about this very issue that you're asking about. And it was recorded. People can get on there and watch that. We also had Dr. Knight, our campus physician from here at, at Southwestern Seminary, our campus physician. He was on and articulated some really important things about that. So I'd, I'd really, um, I'd encourage anyone to go on to that. But, but here's one of the things that I, that we've just seen. And Dr. Knight was the one that sent me this information. There have been some additional studies that have taken place on, on singing and the actual framework of distance, of distance in the way that um, the aerosolized particles are, are being transmitted. And they're finding some, some encouraging results in this study. They've also done a bit of a deeper dive into the, into the church choir or the community choir, I'm not sure what it was in Washington, realizing that they had a, a pretty significant food fellowship prior to the, to the rehearsal. Okay. That, that they had done a lot of connecting prior to that, that several people were infected and Maybe whether they knew it, they knew they weren't feeling well. Um, so 
without without saying that I'm a medical expert, I'm just saying that there's some encouraging information coming out with some pretty strong studies saying we we may not have to be as concerned to just say banning all choirs, banning all singing. Um, in some places that may be necessary. So, so I don't have the final word on this. I'm just saying that, that we are seeing some encouraging uh, uh, more study and, and, and research coming out that I, I can't imagine the Lord knowing, I mean, commanding it in scripture. That, that this is going to be a forever thing that we're not going to be able to sing anymore. I, I just, that, that just doesn't make any sense to me. And I, I'm, I'm really hopeful about what the, about what the future looks like there um, in that. So I'm, I'm encouraged to be honest. That's great. We, we like to leave this on a high note. Um, yep. So looking uh, ahead to our post COVID life, what would you say are some of the positive things that you see happening as a result of this, that hopefully we will be different on the other side of it. And of course, I think about some of our great hymns of the faith, that they were written in the middle of very dire circumstances and responding to situations, uh, whether personally or nationally, that were happening. So what, what encouragement could you give us for where we're headed? Yeah, I, I think, again, it points back to the reality that a lot of what we thought was absolutely vital in the production nature of experiential worship has, and, and worship is an experience, right? Don't, don't hear me say that that worship of all of all worship on the planet, the Christian worship should be the most experience filled, but experience filled because we're responding in relationship to the God who made us and the God who gave us his word, the, the self-revealing God, the triune God. And that's who we're responding to. We're not responding to a cool leader. We're not responding to a great synth pad and a sound. We're not responding to a hot band. We're not responding to a, to an organist with a DMA. And all those things are great things. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a dean of a music school for goodness sake. So we're training, we're training excellence in all those ways. But in worship, we've got to be careful to make sure that we're responding to God and that music is a wonderful servant, but it's a horrible master. Mm. So I, I think, I think if, if in any way we can see that, that worship has been uh, boiled down to its biblical essence, um, that is, that's a wonderful thing. And it's been a hard lesson for us. But I think that's a, a really, really positive thing. The other thing that I think has happened is, is that people have realized just how special it is to gather together and just how special it is to be in community and to be in fellowship and to be encouraged. And, I, you know, I often hear people use the excuse, well, you know what, I, they don't, I, I mean, I, I don't get anything out of it. I don't, I don't want to go a bunch of, with a bunch of hypocrites. And I want to stop and say, you know, the moment you walked into the church, the, the church was hypocritical. So, <laughs> but, but what we miss sometimes is the realization that, that as, as Paul so beautifully articulated that we're all part of this body and that, that we contribute, we not only receive, but we also contribute to the body. And, and the wonderful aspect of seeing, seeing our place fitted together in the body of Christ for the glory of God and for the hope of the nations. I, I begin to see this as, I can't wait for next Sunday again. I mean, I cannot wait to get back together. And it's just given to us, and I think a lot of people, a longing for, we were designed to be in community. And we were designed, for, again, for that relationship and worship relationship. So I think those things are great. And I think um, people, you're right, people have, people have sung some hymns that maybe they haven't been familiar with. And uh, they've realized, wow, there's a lot of power in the in biblical connection point in, in the words of these rich words that we can sing through lament, that we can sing through suffering, that we can sing through social crisis that we've been in and that we can lament and but realize, oh my goodness, what a joy it is to do that. Dr. Kreider, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you Dr. McCoy. God bless you.
You too. By the way, if you are interested in any of those resources that he was referring to, including some very helpful guidelines on church reopening for your worship ministry, you can visit www.artistictheologian.com. And for more information about Southwestern Seminary and Scarborough College, including our eight-week fully online courses this summer and in the fall, visit swbts.edu. This is Ministry Now. Until next time, live your calling.